I found that so valuable last year. Like there would be days where like, I've just got, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to spend my day in the vineyard. Like, yeah, I'm not going to, not going to go into the office. That's not, I just don't want to deal with the stuff which is sitting on my computer right now, but I, I, I will happily go and tend vines. Like that, that was a, was, was, was a wonderful escape for, uh, for big chunks of particularly last spring when everything just felt so uncertain and so fraught. Today on Dirty Linen, we are heading across the seas to California. We are chatting to Jason Haas from Tablas Creek Winery in California. I feel like there's so many synergies between the Australian and Californian experience of dining and enjoying food and wine, uh, climatic uh, similarities, cultural similarities. Uh, we love gathering around food and we I think we're dealing with a lot of the same things. But of course, there are so many differences with the Australian and US experience, especially around COVID. Um, Jason is a really interesting thinker and speaker around wine. Welcome to Dirty Linen. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. I, there's so much that I want to talk to you about, but I'd love to start with Aspen Food and Wine, which I know you're just returned from. I saw all over my Instagram feed American chefs, winemakers, foodies enjoying this uh, food celebration and a food festival. We've just we've had you know every single festival cancelled here for the past year and a half. I was just so excited to see people gathering and celebrating food in that way. Uh, honestly, it felt really weird because um, we've we've been having basically the same experience. I mean, things were all canceled until the middle of this year. And then as we got into late summer and fall, it's it's been sort of a, a toss up as to whether things would happen or not. So I kept waiting to get the announcement that this was was going to be canceled or postponed. And it wasn't. And it was wonderful. What was the feeling like there? Because, the, you know, when I saw pictures, it just looked like everybody was utterly thrilled. I think there was just so much excitement to be able to be out and and about and socializing and, and talking with people in person and reconnecting with with friends you hadn't seen in some cases in, in, in a year and a half. I, I think it was a little bit of like recess. Um, everyone's everyone's out of school and get a chance to gets a chance to celebrate. <laughs> what happens at Aspen stays at Aspen. <laughs> we're, we're hoping that nothing, at least nothing that happens at Aspen gets transmitted elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> sure. Oh God, there is that. Uh, but they did. I mean, they 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 instituted a, either a vaccine requirement or a negative COVID test within the last seventy two hours in order to get a, a wristband to get into any of the events. So um, they did sort of their piece to to make sure, as much as they could, that if they were going to host it, they were going to be able to host it safely. But um, it still it did. It felt it felt amazing and weird and and cool and and kind of new and fresh in a in a way that I don't know that I would have predicted before I went. Mm. Well, that's really heartening and hopeful. Um, I would definitely want to talk a lot about, you know, the, how you've been dealing with COVID and the restrictions around that and um, vaccines and everything. But first of all, just put us in the picture. Just explain to people uh, uh, what Tablas Creek is, where it is, uh, what you guys are up to. Sure. So we are an estate vineyard and winery in Paso Robles, California, which for people who haven't spent much time in California is in the central coast. We're almost equidistant between Los Angeles and San Francisco. So like four, four hours south of San Francisco, two hours north of Santa Barbara, five hours south of Napa and Sonoma, which is the wine country that, that most people know. But there's a thousand wineries between L.A. and San Francisco, and that's sort of generally referred to as the central coast. Um, and so uh, we, we ended up here because this was the place that had the climate that was the most similar to the, the Chateau Neuf du Pape region in France. We're co-founded by the Perrin family from Chateau de Beaucastel in Chateau Neuf du Pape, as well as, as well as by my family. And my dad and the, the two Perrin brothers spent four years looking, looking throughout California before settling on Paso Robles back in 1989. And what what's what are the features of the winery today? Like, what do you guys specialize in? So our our goal from the beginning has been to kind of riff on Chateau Neuf du Pape and the Southern Rhone. So we started off by importing cuttings of all the varieties that they they work with, or at least the principal ones that they work with at Bocastel. So started with Morvedra and Grenache and Syrah and Cunois on the red side, and Roussan, Marsan, Viognier, and Grenache Blanc on the white side. 
and have bit by bit um, expanded that to include the rest of the Chateau Neuf Pop collection. So things like Picardin and Muscardin and saint so and Bourbon, some of the, the obscure red and white Rhone varieties. So we do roughly 30,000 cases of wine a year um, and now do 15 or 20, sometimes even 25 different wines each year that are some combination of varietal bottlings of these unusual grapes and blends that put them together in different ways. So we do reds and whites, um, some rosé, but all in that greater kind of Rhone, Rhone style, Rhone Rangers theme. And I mean, I have to give you an extra special thank you for chatting to me during harvest. Uh, how is it shaping up this year? Um, it's looking really high quality, but low in quantity. Um, we're only about a quarter of the way in, so it's it's early to make really concrete estimates. But my guess is that we're off somewhere between a quarter and a third compared to most recent years. But the payoff, I think, is going to be that the quality is going to be outstanding. Um, and if you're going to be scarce, it might as well be really good. Uh, so it's uh, uh, we're we're hoping that the later ripening grapes come in a little less light than the early stuff has come in. But but we'll see. Uh, overall, it's been a fairly, a pretty good summer. It was a, it was a cold and dry winter. We, we only got about half of our normal rainfall last winter. Um, and it was pretty cold. We had 43 frost nights last winter, which tends to make for a smaller crop. But the summer has been beautiful. And um, the conditions have, have seemed great. The vines look super healthy, which is one of the reasons why we were taken by surprise a little bit with how, how light the crop was. It looks like the vines, the vines should be feeling great just based on the way that they look. But I think the, the winter led them to, to produce slightly smaller clusters and slightly smaller berries. And when you, you kind of multiply those out, that sometimes means, oh, we're down by a quarter and it, it wasn't easy to see in the vineyard. Mm. And you, you've got this tagline, farm like the world depends on it. Tell us about your philosophy around farming. We inherit um, organic, a commitment to organic farming from, from what they do at Bocastel. They've been fully organic since the 1950s. But we've built on that over the years. We started farming biodynamically in the early 2010s. Um, we got our biodynamic certification in 2016. And as a part of that, we brought in our own flock of sheep. So in the in the winter when when the vines are dormant and we have cover crops growing, we have a flock of 200 sheep that graze the vineyard and turn that cover crop into manure and build up the soil's carbon content. We've we've we're now 100% solar powered. Um, we're, we're largely dry farmed, so we've we've almost eliminated our need to our need to pump groundwater. And because of all of these things that we were doing, we got an invitation to be the pilot participant in a new program called Regenerative Organic Certified. Um, and this is the goal of this program is to kind of kind of put together what would be the gold standard of farming. Um, building on organic and biodynamic, but also including a reduction in the demand for scarce resources like water and power and a commitment to social welfare and farm worker fairness and animal welfare. So um, because of the stuff that we were doing, we got the invitation to be a part of this in the pilot program and got the first regenerative organic certification for any any vineyard in the world a year ago. And that's their slogan. It's the slogan of the Regenerative Organic Alliance is farm like the world depends on it. Uh, it's so exciting and impressive. Um, what does it, I mean, has it meant anything in a practical sense to have the certification or is it a sort of vote of confidence in what you're doing? Does it inspire you to do the next thing? Like, you know, what is, how does it actually impact? So it, there are some impacts that we've seen just in, in, in changes that we had to make in order to get the certification. I mean, we were doing most of the things already, but not all of them. So we've been, we've had to be much more systematic about measuring the results of the things that we were doing. We were, we were more process based than we were results based in our vineyard farming. So we've had to do things like measure our soils carbon content and see how it's changed based on what we've done in the vineyard. And like, that's been really informative. Um, and the other, the other thing that we've had to do differently is, I mean, we've always done a lot of, a lot of work with our, our farming crew. I mean, we've, we made the commitment to give them year round employment back 25 years ago, and um, we've paid them a living wage for that, that whole time. But one of the things that the regenerative organic certification asks you to do is to essentially solicit and 
and actively encourage feedback from the, the, the farming crew whose, whose boots are on the ground and whose hands are on the vines. Make sure that it's not just kind of a hierarchical, like you tell your viticulturist what you want and your viticulturist tells your, tells your crew boss and the crew boss tells the crew that instead you're doing roundtable meetings where you're asking the crew what they're seeing and seeing what suggestions they have and then and then as it makes sense implementing those suggestions. So that's been a really cool thing to see to see develop and just to see the 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 level of engagement that this has encouraged among crew that in many cases has been here for a decade or more. But just their the way that they interact with the vineyard has changed based on these new these new structures that we've set up. That's really interesting. I mean, so many, so much farming relies on seasonal workers, but you do you, so you don't bring in any extra workers at busy times like harvest? So it depends a little bit on the year. Um, probably two thirds of the vintages we can get by with just the crew, just our full time crew. So we have a full time field crew of 12. Um, and that's enough because our harvest is so spread out because of all the different grapes that we grow. That's enough barring something unusual to do to do the whole harvest with just our own crew um, of course there are years where you have a big heat spike and several things get ripe at once or you have a storm coming and you you're worried that you got to get out, get things in into the cellar before you otherwise might where we've had to bring in extra crew for a week or two but that's definitely the exception rather than the rule Wow, it's really it's just my mind's just like racing, wondering how how and if this could be applied <clears throat> to other types of farming. I mean, Australian farming relies so heavily on seasonal workers, and we're really in the shit at the moment because that seasonal workforce is is largely international. So it relies on backpackers that are coming here. It relies on workers that are brought in from overseas for a particular purpose. Um, and with COVID, that just isn't happening. Uh, I mean, I, I is it. I hear what you're saying about your harvest being spread out. A lot of crops don't work like that, but I'm wondering if it's, you know, if it would work in other arenas. I mean, do you, do you know of other types of farming where this model is applied? I, well, I, the, the short answer is no. Um, but I think the, the appeal of this is something that applies beyond wine. I, mean, I know one of the things that the Regenerative Organic Alliance has done, and, and the, it's important to say up front that the the ROC, the, the Regenerative Organic Certified Program, is not a wine-specific program. There's, a, there's separate protocols for row crops and orchards and cotton and chocolate and aquaculture and livestock. And there's, I think there's 13 different protocols. And so the idea is that they all follow the central kind of regenerative farming tenets where you are building up your soils, you're using your your farm to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and promote biodiversity and, and resource conservation. And I, I think one of the things that we're seeing, at least in the farms that have adopted this in California, is that it works really well um, for farms that, that do mixed agriculture. So it's not, it's not, it's hard to do for monoculture. If somebody's just farming soybeans or just farming corn, but it works much better if you have a farm that you maybe are running pigs in, um, in the times of year where you don't have a crop there and that helps with your tillage. And then you're, you're rotating through perennial crops and row crops and, and livestock. And it, I mean, that, that is ultimately the most sustainable sort of a farm to have because you are, you have the animals there that are producing a lot of the nutrition for your soil that gets pulled out of the ground by whatever your, whatever your fruit or vegetable crop is. Um, and those end up being the most productive, productive acres of farmland in the world. The challenge is that they're just, they require more expertise and they're more hands-on. They require more labor to, to, to run. But ultimately I think farming is going to have to move in that direction in order to really be sustainable over the long term. Mm, it's just another, uh, it's another um, reason that monoculture is so bad for in, in every way for land for um, and for people it's um yeah I hadn't really put that all together in that way but it's, it really makes a lot of sense 
Um, Jason, let's talk uh, about the pandemic in the last 18 months. In, in, in some ways, I feel like Australia's pandemic has only just begun. The last 18 months have been characterised more by restrictions than actual illness and death. But we've now got Delta running rampant, at least in Sydney and Melbourne, where I am. Australia's two biggest cities are in an extended lockdown. Um And for the first time, really, it feels like cases are out of control. We're not going to be able to put this one back in the box. Um, While we've been in our, you know, while we've been in Fortress Australia and kept the virus more or less out, we've watched the US go through a very different experience. Um, Tell us how you've tracked through this crazy time. Yeah, I mean, I think I think in in the United States, we got to the point that maybe you're feeling now sometime sometime late, early last summer, um, where I feel like at least at a federal level, they stopped even really trying to to keep things bottled up and instead kind of pivoted to, to balancing like regional restrictions when it looked like maybe local hospital capacity would get overwhelmed or emergency services would get overwhelmed, but otherwise trying to open things up and keep the economy moving. Um, and I, I mean, it's produced enormous suffering. I mean, we've well, we've had 600,000 deaths to COVID just in America. So I, I certainly don't feel like um, our model is anything that, that the rest of the world should look to. But um, it has meant that, at least for us from a business perspective, um, I mean, we had three months of being shut down last spring between mid-March and mid-June, and then reopened kind of with restrictions. We reopened outside only. We haven't, we didn't uh, welcome people back inside our tasting room until uh, about two months ago. Um, otherwise, we were doing everything outside, pouring outside. Restaurants were serving outside only for, for most of last year. Um, and a lot of travel was restricted. People weren't really getting on airplanes. So instead of having people flying to California from, from other parts of the country and other parts of the world, we were basically seeing other Californians who maybe felt like it was would be a nice, nice, safe escape to get out of L.A. or out of San Francisco and take that four hour drive to to wine country and spend a spend a week or a long weekend here. Um, so our direct business saw these interruptions in in the spring of last year. And then again, we had another shutdown. Um, as an, as a, another peak came through here in, in December and January. But those were balanced by a big explosion in e-commerce and, and phone orders. Um, and then we saw in the, in the, the wholesale world, because we sell roughly equal amounts direct and, and through wholesalers, so basically through restaurants and, and retailers, we saw a lot of channel shifting where people were buying more at retail and less at restaurants. Um, and the sorts of restaurants that were doing well changed. So we felt like we had to spend all of last year just kind of hopping from what was working, um, trying to figure out why something that wasn't working wasn't working and making sure that we'd, we could reallocate our own resources and our own efforts towards things that were possible. Um, and so like you heard, you, everyone was talking about pivoting. I felt like I spent all of like the first year of this pandemic pivoting madly from one thing into something else, trying to make sure that we weren't uh, blindly throwing effort after something which wasn't going to be viable and ignoring something that was, that was now newly possible. So I feel like I've learned a huge amount about business and about connecting with customers over the last year. And I'm proud of sort of where we ended up, but it's been, it really has been one, one new effort after another. In Australia, you know, the, parameters of operating a hospitality business are pretty well mandated by the state governments. So we're given restrictions in terms of density limits or numbers of customers or whether people are allowed inside or only outside, um, whether they, you know, people need to uh, check in when they get to a, to a venue to assist in contact tracing, which I think is a much bigger effort here than it is in the US. Uh, is most of the things that you've done your own initiatives or have they been mandated by one level of government or another? It's been a mix. Um, certainly like the for the most of last year, wineries were told that they could only pour outside. Um, there were kind of uh, every state was left to more or less its own devices to come up with 
come up with plans. There were some states like Texas and Florida that basically said, eh, just open up, anything goes. Um, there were others like California and a lot of the states in New York and New England, which, which were much more prescriptive about what you could do. So depending on what the local case rate was, you were allowed to be inside or outside, inside at certain reduced capacities. And as those case averages went up or down, what you were allowed to do would could, could change. But we made the decision early on that uh, operating outside was so much safer than operating inside that even if we were allowed inside, we weren't going to reopen inside. We were just going to use the outside space that we that we developed. And we got lucky in that we had a fairly a fairly um, dry winter. We weren't we weren't forced inside by lots of storms. Of course, the downside of that is that we're not harvesting very many grapes this year. But it was it was good for the hospitality side of hospitality side of things. Um, but we. So there were certain parameters we were working within, but there were people who were pushing the boundaries of what they were allowed to do a lot more than we were. We were definitely, I would say, erring on the side of safety rather than the side of maximizing the amount of business that we could do. Mm. And tell me what kinds of things you've noticed about, you know, changing the architecture of those tastings, just in terms of what kinds of customers, what kind of experience you're able to offer them, what kinds, yeah, whether it translated into wine sales going up or down. Yeah, so that's one of the things that we learned that I feel a little silly that I, we hadn't done the research to learn earlier. So when when we were reopening last June, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had control over our traffic. We didn't want people building up in 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 line in our parking lots and waiting for tables and 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 us not having control of our flow. So we moved from just come on in. We didn't need a reservation to being all by reservation. We moved from tasting bars where you would just kind of belly up to the bar and you'd have people next to you. And if, if we had another group come, we'd find space, space for them somewhere at another bar uh, to everybody had their own table. So with, with everyone having their own table and their own like dedicated time slot, it, it made for an experience that we realized was a lot more conducive to storytelling. Um, it's hard when you might have four groups in front of you at one bar to really get into the details of, of what you do and why you do it, because not everybody's at the same point in their tasting. Um, you want to give a little intro to somebody who shows who, who's newly arrived. And if the other people have heard that three times already, it, it starts to feel really forced. So you're, you're sort of left to giving kind of telegraphic information about the wine that you just poured someone and waiting for questions. Whereas when you have somebody at a table and it's just you and them, you can really get into the stories and get into the whys behind the, 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 the facts that you're telling them in a way that you couldn't. And we saw that our, even though our traffic was down because we were controlling our traffic and, and limiting our capacity, our sales per customer went up by about 50%. Um, and our, our, our conversion to our wine club went up a similar amount. And even more interestingly for me, we used to have different goals for our tasting room for Saturdays, which were always our busiest day, and for the rest of the week. We thought that it was just a different kind of customer on Saturday, probably a less serious wine customer, and so we should have lower goals. Um, and that was borne out over time that we just we sold less wine per customer and had a lower wine club conversion percentage on Saturdays. So lo and behold, when we went to reservations and actually having control over our traffic, the difference between Saturdays and the rest of the week disappeared. So it wasn't that it was a different kind of customer. We just weren't taking as good a care of them. And that for me, really drove home that we needed to learn from this experience and not just because we were we were able to get permission to go back inside and start pouring again, go back to our old model. Um, so we converted our tasting room from like walk-up bars to, to bar seating. So it's not like you go to a sushi bar and you there's a certain number of seats that are there and you have that space for a certain amount of time. And so we can, again, give people that more kind of more, more, more focused experience than we could before, um, even as we have different spaces inside and outside. And could you do this with the same number of staff? 
No, we've had to add staff. Um, it's, it's, there's just more space. Uh, there's more distance to cover. Uh, even though even though our traffic overall is about the same as it was before the pandemic now, uh, the, just the, the distance between like the bottom of our patio and the top of our patio and all of the spaces in the tasting room means that it takes more people to take care of people. You can't have just a couple people, one or two people behind a bar taking care of five or six groups. But it's worth it because the spend is increased. Yeah, exactly. That's so interesting. I mean, I'm sure you could apply some of those same lessons to the restaurant experience where you may have fewer customers, but if you're able to really engage with them in a, in a deeper way, then yeah, it makes sense that they're going to be more engaged with your product and, and want more of it. I think it's applicable across a lot of businesses. I, I think there's one of the things that I've believed in for a long time is that if you are staffed for your average traffic you're missing a lot of opportunities because when you have the most people there, you're taking the worst care of them. And so you're probably not doing the job that you should in terms of converting customers into or visitors into customers and customers into sales. So uh, the, the advantage now of the way that we're doing it is that we know how many people are coming. We know how many customers we're going to have on a given day. We know how much staff we need in order to take good care of them. So there's actually less, there's less less sort of people standing around um, because we will know the day before if we have a super light day and we can tell somebody, oh, you don't need to come in tomorrow. Um, and instead, and, or conversely, if we know we have a busy day, we know we can staff up. So it ends up being a little more efficient um, in that way. But overall, it, it does cost a little more to take care of people, I think, because they're staying longer and they just take up, they take up more of our space per per amount of time that, um, that, that, that they're here, but it's definitely been worth it. And especially, I guess, if you get them in your wine club, then you've got that, long, that longevity as well. Yeah. I mean, the, the tasting room is the main, main entry point, the main, the, the mouth of the funnel to somebody who might eventually become a wine club member. So, um, if we give them a better experience, then yeah, there's a greater chance they'll sign up for the wine club and hopefully they'll stick for, stick around for years and visit multiple times going forwards and, and order wine from us. So it's the, there are extra benefits to a good experience there beyond just the, the, the cost and expense or whatever the, the revenue and expense ratio of, of their visit that first day. Mm. Okay, let's talk about vaccines because it's a massive conversation here, I guess, as it is everywhere. The, the US is way ahead of Australia in terms of getting um, vaccine into into people's arms. W what are the what are the rules, and what are you guys doing? So there are no rules. Um, we are we are basically at the point where governments and is starting to be at the federal level and a little bit at the state level are starting to move from strongly encouraging vaccines to requiring vaccines for certain sorts of activities. Uh, there was just a, a federal proposal to require vaccines for all, all, all businesses that have federal contracts or, and, and all businesses that have a hundred or more employees will have to either mandate uh, weekly testing or vaccines for all their employees. So they're trying to to kind of ratchet up the pressure on people to get vaccinated. Um, and I, I, honestly, I cannot believe that there is there is as much resistance as there is to to a vaccine, which is so effective and so safe. Um, it's I mean, it's really a miraculous, uh, miraculous uh, scientific advance um, that it's happened this fast and it's basically available for free to anyone whenever you want it. And yet there's like 30% of the, of the population that is adamantly opposed to getting it. So um, anyway, that's beyond my own frustration with that. Um, it's basically been left to individual businesses to decide what they would like to mandate for their own employees and if they want to mandate anything for their guests. Um, so we have just, just, uh, about a month ago moved to requiring proof of vaccination for our indoor tastings. Um, and it's gone very smoothly. I was actually worried that we would get a lot of pushback and we really haven't. Um, but 
we're again we're not in, we're not working in a vacuum here there's lots of uh, there's there's lots of restaurants in san francisco that are doing this and more in la and i think they actually just the la city council just um either passed or said that they would be passing a law requiring that anyone who wants to enter a bar um either to work or to visit is going to require have to have to be vaccinated so i think as things like this become more common um it's going to make it easier on everybody who's who's doing it just because it won't be unexpected and what's the mechanism by which you ask people to prove their vaccination status so we decided to be pretty uh, pretty um would open about different ways to do it. So basically we ask people to either show their vaccine card or a lot of people have just taken pictures of it and have it on their phone or a picture of their vaccine card or a state issued, um, there's different state registries that you can show with a QR code that says I've been vaccinated, here's the vac- vaccine date. So basically people can, can show any of those three things um, and that's fine with us. Okay, and what about your staff? So we've luckily had very little... Um, have very little resistance among the staff and the staff who who have not wanted to either for medical reasons or just because they haven't they're not mentally there yet. Um, we've been able to to make sure that they can be outside only and um, still be productive and and contribute to what we're doing. Mm. And it's interesting that you know you said there's this thirty percent of uh, Americans who are adamantly opposed to getting vaccinated, but you, but you actually haven't had any pushback to mandating it for your indoor customers. Do you think it's just a is that just a self selecting group that you attract? Um, that uh, is there. I don't, like what is it? Is there a crossover between people that like wine and people that like being vaccinated? What what is that? <laughs> I, I do I do think in general there's a correlation between um, kind of uh, socioeconomic status and education and uh, both of which are correlated with higher vaccine acceptance and wine lovers. I think that there's a correlation between that, though it's obviously not 100%. Um, I think some of it is that we have a, a, a very attractive alternative. I mean, a lot of people would prefer to be outside anyway. So it's not like the 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 option of being outside instead of inside has has felt like it's making people second class citizens. Um, and I think some of it's just luck. I, you, you never you don't you never know what's going to set someone off. But um, I think you can you can kind of kill people with kindness, make them make them feel like they really are welcome, and we really do value their value their patronage and their visit and we're going to give them a wonderful experience even if they uh, even if they choose to be outside because because they're not vaccinated okay so is it like at the point of booking you'll be like are you are you guys all vaccinated um and they're like oh no you know john isn't um i am but he's not and you and you're like okay so you will have to sit outside and they're like okay no worries so it mostly most of our bookings happen online so um, it's, and that's in the information and they have to, they have to check a box that says, yes, I understand that I will need to show proof of vaccination to, to taste inside. So I think some people get to that point and are like, oh, I guess I'm booking outside. Or maybe they get to that point and say like, screw Tablas Creek. I don't want to go any place where there's a vaccine man and I'm going to go visit another winery. Um, but in either case, it, it happens before people are like at our front door expecting to walk in. Mm. Interesting. And I think that's important. I did, I wouldn't I don't want it to be a surprise to people because I think that's that's a recipe for conflict. I mean, would it give you some comfort if it was mandated throughout California that this this was the rule? Yeah, for sure. Um absolutely. I I think I think it gives it gives cover to um it gives cover to businesses who are trying to do the right thing to have that be a mandate rather than a strong suggestion, which is the way that it's worded now. Mm, interesting. Um, okay, Jason, well, I feel like there's about about 40,000 other things we could talk about, but is there anything that you want to touch on in this conversation? Oof. Um, I feel like there are a million things to talk about, but I also feel like we've, we've covered a lot of the, a lot of the really critical ones. It's, it, it has, it has been a, a fascinating last year last year and a half i know i've looked kind of jealously at what was going on in australia a lot of last year thinking oh man like if we had just done a better job of contact tracing and of of taking this virus seriously at the beginning like we would be in such a better 
such a better state. Uh, but it does seem like it may just be a question for different places of when and not if um, the, I mean, the virus is not, the viruses are not going to get, not going to be held at bay indefinitely by, by, by quarantines and lockdowns. Ultimately they have to be defeated by, by vaccines or by acquired immunity. Um, so I, I hope that your, your, your path um, and your community's path through this is um, less, less traumatic and disruptive than, than ours has been. Thank you. Well, I think, in, you know, in, definitely in terms of illness and death, it, it has been, although, you know, we are seeing sadly some deaths now and we also did last year, but definitely not on the scale um, of, in the US and many other places around the world. So I'm extremely grateful for that. But it, yeah, it does look like there are lots of different ways to get pandemic management wrong. And um, yeah, we found some we found some good ones. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really that's a really wonderful quote I'm, i think i'm going to use it um <laughs> you can you can have it because yeah uh, there are lots of bad choices and and that's that's often i felt like what we were dealing with last year is that there were no good choices there were just there were just kind of gradations of bad to really bad um every every choice you made had certain negative consequences and you were just trying to muddle through to to, to minimize the amount of, of risk you were taking on and the amount of harm that, that you were potentially doing. Um, so yeah, it's not, this is not an easy thing. I don't, I, I certainly don't want to imply that like, Oh, if, if, if only we had done this, this, and this, this all would have, this all would have gone away. It would have been a, an incredibly difficult challenge and is an incredibly, incredibly difficult challenge for everywhere. Yeah, I think, you know, in some ways I, I feel a bit jealous of people who are on the land and I know there's many, many challenges, but at least you've got that sense of the seasons rolling and you can put your hands in the dirt and you can have this other thing going on that's not always about the pandemic. I, I found that so valuable last year. Like there would be days where like I've just got, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend my day in the vineyard. Like, I'm not going to not going to go into the office. That's not I just don't want to deal with the stuff which is sitting on my computer right now. But I, I I will happily go and tend vines like that. That was a was was a wonderful escape for for big chunks of particularly last spring when everything just felt so uncertain and so fraught. Mm. Oh, well, Jason, it's really been wonderful to speak to you. Good luck with the rest of the, of vintage at Tablas Creek. I definitely need to try your wine. Is it available in Australia at all? It is. We actually do export a little bit to Australia. Um, not not a lot. It's like, I, I don't know, maybe 50 cases a year, but you you should be able to find it. Okay, I'm going to find it. Because, you know, at the start of the pandemic, and especially we came off the back of dreadful bushfires, you know, it was it was all about buy Australian, support Australian, and I'm still all about that. But I have been sneaking in some wines from overseas. While we can't travel, I am at least traveling in wine and finding it, yeah, really, really um, comforting and promising. And, yeah, it just reminds me that there's other experiences out there. <laughs> For sure. And if, if people who are listening want to want to get a little glimpse into our experience, um, I'd like I'd love to give a, little, give a little plug for the blog that we write, because we I, I, I try to make sure that it does get inside the sorts of things that are keeping me up at night or are getting me excited. Um, so if people go to the Tablas Creek website, which is just tablascreek.com, there's a link from there to the blog. And we've, we've basically had a blog post a week for 15 years. So if you want to, you, you want to track the things that, uh, the things that I've been trying to figure out during COVID or the, the challenges that we think we might be facing going forwards or our excitement about regenerative organics or any of those pieces, um, that's, that's, that's where, where people can find it. Yeah, well, I think the blog's great. So, yeah, thanks for giving that a shout out. We'll put the link in the show notes as well. Jason, take care. It's been fantastic to talk to you. Um, thanks again for uh, giving us some time over here at Dirty Linen. We appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. 
We can't wait to hear from you. This is